Monster is next on BCTV. morning. It would seem evident to me and to you too perhaps that because of the great political protestations and the business world's protestations on the BRIC deal which is now apparently going to go through that BRIC has retreated considerably on several major segments of the original deal involving 670 million dollars or more of taxpayers money. Yesterday, and of all places, the Ontario Securities Commission in Toronto, the BRIC officials and their lawyers went to make new promises about certain aspects of the deal which are not popular politically or otherwise in British Columbia. And I'll be talking about that in a little while. Also today, we've got a story on what happens to the unfortunate forgotten people in the civil service strikes the temporaries and the casuals who are caught between the devil and the deep blue sea if this thing is ever properly settled by a vote. As well this morning we're going to meet perhaps the authors of a book called The Sacrament, Dyer and Johnson. They're not the authors, they were the people who survived a plane crash in harrowing circumstances on this continent not so long ago. And my old friend Richard Dickey Roma who keeps write, writing alarmist books. This one's called Periscope Red. As well, this being a busy Friday morning, we think we may have a federal cabinet minister bounce in on his jet to fill us in on what's the latest in appeasing the West on the constitutional crisis. But first, how to polish a brick. <laughs> The checks for some $665 million are on the way, or will be on the way shortly, for BRIC, that's you and me and the other shareholders, to take over Kaiser Resources for something like $665 million. And the funniest thing happened in Ontario yesterday. You'll recall that Bennett has obviously refused to have any public examination of the merits of the Kaiser takeover. You'll recall that there are something like three investigations been going on, one by the superintendent of brokers in BC, one by a lawyer appointed to look at insider trading from this end called Leon Getz, and one by the Ontario Securities Commission. Now the Ontario Securities Commission had apparently been concerned about the basic fact that Kaiser, with all his holdings, was going to get more, in effect, than the tendered $55 a share on which the deal was made, right? So they looked at that yesterday, and when Brick retreated two or three steps, they said, well, as far as they were concerned, the deal could go ahead. Now, what were these steps on which Brick retreated yesterday? Because we've had such a solid front from Brick and its half dozen of directors, only three of whom could vote because of conflict of interest and not being there. Um, what, what would really upset the public was uh, the apparent appearance of special concessions to Kaiser himself. That's the best way to demonstrate it to you is perhaps this. One was by which he remains a director of the company, brings in his sales marketing organization, and becomes the winner of a lotto million every month. That was best put to us the other day by the leader of the opposition, Mr. Barrett, who must be quite pleased this morning that that particular concession can now be changed if the BRIC directors want to. And here's what Webster got from Barrett. Does Mr. Edgar Kaiser become 
a director of Brick, when this tender is taken up, if everything, if, if there's no government interference on the seventh, the, prior to the seventh of October. Yes, he becomes a director, and also he reaps a three and a half percent profit off of all sales of uh, what was left of Kaiser Coal to the Japanese. Now and let me get that clear. Yeah. Edgar Kaiser becomes a director of Brick. That's correct. Edgar Kaiser, under the terms of the document, does he? maintain and operate his sales company. That is correct. How much does he get for maintaining and operating his sales company? Three and a half percent of the total sales volume, which works out close to a million dollars a month. I made the remark a week ago that he wins the lottery, a million dollar lottery every month without having to lift a finger. As a director of the company, does Edgar Kaiser therefore collect between 12 and 13 million dollars a year commission for his sales organization with its corporate jet? With, with his sales? On sales already made? That is correct. On Sales are already made, he's getting commissions, and he's carrying that over with him into being a, a director on Brick as well. Is that ethical? Have you had any no. legal advice no, on that? No, it is not ethical. It is not ethical. It is not ethical. It is not reasonable. When you sell your assets, you have no moral right to claim a commission off assets part of which is contracts for the sale of coal. But he will be he will be the sales agent for Kaiser through his marketing organization as a director of Kaiser. Jack, there is nothing ethical about that. There is nothing moral about that. That's just big business. Now, let me explain to you how Kaiser, how Brick has backed down. That particular clause in the takeover bid said that Edgar Kaiser's marketing company would have the exclusive sales agency rights for four years with an option Brick's option to extend it for three years. The take on that annually on sales already made would have been for the first four years, four, three, twelve, four, four, five, about fifty million dollars in commissions, even if they hadn't taken up the second option. Now, when they walked into the Ontario Securities Commission examination yesterday, Kaiser have amended, Brick has amended the agreement. So that Kaiser Resources Limited may terminate the agreement at any time on 90 days' notice. We hope to have Mr. Halliwell here on Tuesday morning to find if that's an open ended termination on each of the sides. Brick, no, it will be. Brick owns Kaiser, so Kaiser will be able, Brick will be able to terminate that Edgar Kaiser marketing deal at 90 days' notice. And Mr. Hallowell, will, I'm sure, will tell us that this amendment has been made because of public pressure, probably because of Barrett's graphic way of putting it to the people of B.C. that Edgar Kaiser wins a lot of a month on sales already made. The second clause which caused considerable public concern were the agreements by which Edgar Kaiser was to buy from Kaiser Resources, Kaiser Oil, valued at book value at the time of the purchase by them of $23 million, and then another $15 million for corporate aircraft and office space and property and furnishings for $15 million. One of the questions raised by myself and everybody else who looked at it was, why was this not independently valued by Brick before they made the deal? Yesterday, when they walked in, uh, Brick were able to say that a firm of chartered accountants is to be appointed to conduct an appraisal of these sets of assets that Kaiser is going to buy. <coughs> $23 million worth and $15 million worth. <coughs> and if the new appraisal set of values is more than 10% higher than the value stated in the offer, then Kaiser will have to pay to Brick something more than the $23 million and the $15 million. Because the oil company has got leases in 14 states and at least one operating oil well. And it was certainly within the public area for people and politicians to say, hey, why wasn't that properly independently valued? to make sure that Edgar didn't get too good a deal. Not the kind of amendment to the deal I'd like to have seen, but I want to make the point that the public pressure in this case and the stock market criticism, many elements of the stock market, have certainly 
caused break, and I hope the board of directors were all present and not in conflict, uh, to agree to amend some aspect which are, in minds of myself and other people, highly generous, to say the least. So the brick caper isn't over yet. Uh, the good news is that brick stock <laughs> went up a dime this morning from 6.10 to 6.20. Since the very beginning of the rumors of the takeover, Kaiser stock has gone from $30 to $44 to $55 a share on the tendered shares. This morning it's trading at under $50, but that's because there are very few shares available. Looking forward to having Mr. Hallowell on the program to convince us, many of the people of British Columbia, who still regard this as a quasi-public company because of the investment of public assets into it, that we now have something more like a reasonably good deal and don't have to wait till we're 150 to see brick achieve what might be its true value. I'll be back after the break. I gotta be quite honest with you. There are times when I get sick and tired of talking to peripatetic authors on the vlog a book tour across the country. And as you know, some of them come off and some of them are dull as dishwasher. Dish water. And as noisy as dishwashers. Anyway, the guy here just now, I'm not going to plug your book. It's Richard Romer. Show his book once. Periscope Red. Oh, I've got it here. I have to show the book. Where is it? You got it? Richard Romer, Periscope Red. It's another panic book about the end of the world, isn't it? Not the end of the world. It's what's going on out there. It's almost as alarmist as the brick story you've just been handling. Let's not talk about the book. You, you turn out these formula books and they sell very well and they're all based with ec confrontation. Give me the list of all your crisis books. It's Ultimatum, Exoneration, Exodus UK and Separation. Last year it was Balls and now it's Ultim no, no, now it's Periscope Red. But it's my formula and it works fairly well. And your formula is to create a military crisis of some kind and end the world or come near to it. Oh, no. Well, you have to, you have to look, at, as I say, with what's going on. There's crude oil having to move through the... And in Persian this particular Gulf. book, in Periscope Red, the generals take, finish up taking over which country? No, I won't tell you. It's got to be a secret. There's got, I have to have something left at the end of the book. Are you still a major general in the Canadian Air Force? No, I'm a major general in the, in the reserve. I'm the chief of reserves of the Canadian Armed Forces. I didn't know we had any. We do, and you should know. You are the Major General in charge of all the reserves of the Canadian Armed Forces. That is correct, and you should be very pleased about that. One whaler, two old biplanes, and uh, a platoon of something. Not so, not so. I know you're not up to date. What do we have the reserve in force, our reserve forces, the reserve forces in case this country faces an incredible military or civil crisis? We have 22,000 people in the reserve force, and I'm very proud to tell you that, and they're great people. It's too bad you're too old, you could, uh, you could participate too. Uh, we'd like to have more equipment, more airplanes and ships and things like what that. We the need age, them. What is the age limit? I won't even talk about your age. No, but your age. My age? Mm. Well, I'm, uh, I'm over 50, but after all, I'm a major general. You were in the Second War. I was in the Second War. I was a fighter pilot. And that's next year's book, by the way. You must be over 60. Oh, heavens no. Absolutely not. I'm in my middle 50s. You were the 12-year-old fighter yeah, I'm pilot. I'm about 15 years younger than you are. I see. But quite seriously, though. When you look at the world today, can we avoid the Holocaust? We've got to avoid it. The situation that is going on in the Middle East is a very dangerous one at, at this stage, and it's escalating. It's not backing down. The, uh, with the Jordanians, the Hussein and his team ready to get into that uh, battle, it's, it can escalate very rapidly. And the consequences for the Western world, because they, they sit in the crude oil area that supplies a large part of the Western world, the thing can be serious because the, the great Russian bear is watching very carefully what the American Eagle is doing and vice versa in that area. I have the feeling, am I wrong? Here we have Iraq, yes. which is what we call one of the New World nations allied to, vaguely to the Russians. That's correct. Here we have Hussein, who really is a pro-Western nation but fully supports Iraq. That's correct. And has offered military help. They're Arabs together. Uh, what the devil are the Iranians? The Iranians are Persians. And they sit next door to 
Iraq, and they sit next door to the Soviet Union. There are many cultural and religious uh, connections between the Arabs and the Persians. Oh, indeed, but there is no racial connection, and they hate each other. They, uh, they are blood enemies. I have a feeling it's a kind of phony war just now. Fire guns from a distance, hit the odd oil tank, but don't let's get involved in face-to-face -face heavy ground conflict. No, that isn't the way I read it at all. They're going at it uh, with airstrikes, and they're, they've got intensive uh, ground warfare going on. I don't think it's a, a mock fair affair at all. I think it's a very serious one, which, is, as I say, can escalate very easily. It's How could it escalate? Well, if the Jordanians, if Jordan got involved uh, in the war directly, that's an escalation by itself. And Hussein has been talking about this. It means that the, some of the other Arab countries, such as Syria, may decide to get in as well. And if this sort of thing uh, goes on, it can escalate to the point where it, in effect, is out of control. If the bombing continues at all, it's conceivable that the Straits of Hormuz will be blocked and that the oil to Japan and the percentage that comes to the United States and Western Europe will stop. It will, it, it, precisely. And the, and the amounts are quite staggering. 93% of the crude oil that's used by Western Europe comes from the OPEC countries and tankers. About 70% of that uh, comes from the Persian Gulf. Uh, the United States takes 5 million barrels of oil a day out of the 18 from the OPEC countries, and about 70% comes from the Persian Gulf. Japan, 100% uh, from overseas, and about 80% uh, of it from the Persian Gulf. It's disaster. For Japan. For Japan. It's disaster for Western Europe. And it's going to be a calamity for the United States and Canada imports 400,000 barrels a day to support Quebec and the Maritimes. But we can do without that if we have to. Well, it's, it would be a rationing squeeze. It would be, that's one quarter of our imports come into Quebec and the Maritimes. So the consequences of a cutoff of the Strait of Hormuz would be alarming uh, for the Western world. And that's what they're concerned about. Now, Russia gets oil on the overland pipeline from Iraq through Syria and Lebanon, does it not? No. Uh, uh, the Soviets uh, take some natural gas, but they are, at this stage, independent. They have their own oil fields, and they supply the Eastern Bloc. But they're running into shortages as well, so that by the middle of this decade, the Soviets are going to be substantially in a shortfall position. And therefore, right now, they're very interested in having a hook into the Middle East, so that they've got more than just a passing interest. Tell me, I'm glad to hear this morning, Richard, um, whatever became of Afghanistan? Afghanistan is sitting there. It's uh, uh, quietly ugging away, and the Soviets have about 80,000 troops tied up in that place, and they're trying to subdue the uh, rebels, and they're having a tough time with it. So, but it's still going, and I dare say the Soviets are it's, pleased. It's that not it's a menace at the moment. Not at the moment. <coughs> uh, but the Soviet position there continues to be a menace. They're just doing a Britain, of course. They're occupying Afghanistan, and it doesn't matter how many of the soldiers get knocked off because it gives them the position to poise to the Indian Ocean if they ever have to make the big move. Of course, of course. That's Am I right? Absolutely. And in my little book called Periscope Red, I have the Americans do a deal with Pakistan, which is just to the south. And they negotiate a position in Pakistan with their own troops. Uh, it's a very, again, that we're talking about the critical area of the world in terms of uh, being explosive. Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, Iraq, Jordan, uh, the whole of the Persian Gulf. It's critical. The talkative general with his periscope red showing. And we'll tie him on some Canadian issues after the break. Major General Richard Romer, author, by the way, of another book called Periscope Red. You look at this country today, you wonder if the thing's going to stick together or split up. Although you're from the East, and you probably are totally confident that this country can be instantly welded by Trudeau's return of the Constitution. You're sure of that? I'm asking you. Are you? Yes. Well, I, I, uh, I'm from all over the place. I don't like to be classified as an Easterner. When I'm in the West, I'm a Westerner. Uh, I think that the, the matter of the Constitution and the way it's being handled is a very grave uh, consideration for the country. We are looking for the first time at what I call unilateralism in dealing uh, with the provinces and with the Constitution. The Prime Minister has elected after his Constitutional Conference collapsed to go at it on a unilateral basis. And furthermore, the unilateralism that he's using in terms of the Constitution and driving it through uh, is now also going to appear in the energy uh, aspects. In other words, the energy policy that's going to be created will be done unilaterally. 
and uh, you, we're going to see this very soon. I think that this uh, is a very poor sign of the health of the country. Energy is not in the constitutional amendments. No, it's not, but the, the Prime Minister has three considerations at the moment. The first one is the Constitution. That's, he promised Quebec that he would fix the Constitution uh, during the referendum, and now he has to make that come true. So this is why he is moving unilaterally. The, the matter of energy is his next priority, so he says, and he's going to deal with that, no longer on a negotiating basis, but on a basis whereby he acts unilaterally. Is it not a fact that with this man, Lahid in Alberta, tough guy, that if he does not like or finds it an unattractive deal, that the development of Western resources, including the tar sands perhaps, as well as cold lake and all the rest of it, will drag and that we will be short of assured supplies. Well, we're, it's dragging now and it's dragging seriously because of this conflict and confrontation between, between Lougheed, Trudeau and Lalonde on the other side. I think what we're going to see, let's look at it uh, uh, from a, a future point of view. The Prime Minister is going to bring in a unilateral energy policy, whether Lougheed likes it or not. He's going to set prices, he's going to put on a tax on natural gas, the whole bit. Uh, then it will be up to Lougheed to react unilaterally within the powers that he has under the British North America Act. That means he can cut off the supply if he wishes to do so. And that would fit nicely into Mr. Trudeau's uh, scenario because when he does that, Mr. Trudeau says to the country, it is obvious that in the public and national interest uh, that we should take over by a declaration under the British North America Act that those resources are in the national interest and he will take over. Do you think that might happen? That, in uh, my view, is undoubtedly in his plan. And I think the people of the country would say, yeah, uh, take it over. But the people of the West might not say, yes, take okay. it over. All right, now you're getting into the referendum scenario because we've seen a referendum take place in Quebec, which fortunately uh, did not succeed. But now we're talking a great deal about the referenda process. And I dare say that uh, when that happens, if it happens the way I've just uh, scenarioed the thing, uh, Mr. Lougheed is going to say, let us have a referendum in the province of Alberta to determine whether or not perhaps whether we want to stay. What about B.C.? B.C. is undoubtedly going to be in a comparable position, but not so grave because the, the resources here in terms of hydrocarbons, natural gas and crude oil are not quite so heavy. But at the same time, I think that uh, B.C. is going to look very closely at what Lougheed is doing. Now, you're saying that Trudeau might well be hell-bent for self-destruction of the nation. Well, all the seeds, talking about seeds, are there for a tremendous uh, alienation Even of the if West. He's, there's a story this morning that he's thinking about backing down and throwing a, a crumb to the NDP to spell out the right of provinces to own and control their natural resources. Now, if he did that, he couldn't go ahead with your disaster plan. No, he, he could not. He would, he would say that the provinces own the, the natural resources subject to a declaration under the British North America Act or whatever the act is going to be called once it's patriot. Canada Act. Canada Act. That's a, very, that's a novel name. Uh, that, it, that there could be an overriding declaration in the national interest. I doubt that he would give up totally any hold that he might have on the natural resources. I doubt it very much, even though it might be a sop to broadband. Uh, would you care to delineate your own political affiliation? Uh, my own political affiliation is I'm an observer of all of these good things. And uh, that's the best I can do at the moment. Very good, Richard. And you're actively running this reserve force. I'm actively, I spend about 110, 120 days a year at it. I have an office and staff at NDHQ and I'm part of the National Defense Headquarters staff. When I'm there and when I'm on the road. You're, in, we... you're in good hands, Jack. I don't know. I don't know about the state of the Canadian Armed Forces. Are you bilingual in all your units? No, not in all our units, of course not. We have some substantial units uh, in militia units in uh, British Columbia, naval units. Uh, we Do have you have any in Quebec? Yes, of course. They, some of them are bilingual. But the militia, uh, I really think the people in it do a great job. They're underpaid, and, uh, but they're good Canadians. Richard Roman, I'm grateful for your presence this morning. I hope, uh, what's his name? Periscope Red goes well. Thank you. I hope you're wrong. I hope I'm wrong. On the constitutional crisis. I hope I'm wrong too. My thanks to Richard Roman. I'll be back after the break. The federal clerk strike isn't quite over yet, but if you were casual or on probation, 
it's likely you're out of work today anyway. Casuals who didn't cross the picket line out of confusion, at least in one case, have been fired. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Brown of Surrey worked at the taxation office. She was being trained as a specialist on the telex machines. She was advised by her boss not to cross the picket line. Later, she found out by way of a letter that she was fired. Where does Elizabeth stand now? Here's Steve. This is the first letter, a form letter, that Elizabeth received, signed by the tax center's director. It warned her to appear for work on October 3rd by 10 a.m. She didn't find the letter on her doorstep until one in the afternoon. The next day, another form letter. Elizabeth was fired. She is not a member of PSAC because she had been working at the tax center for less than six months. On Tuesday, I phoned and a department official told me that I could not report for work, uh, that the letters upon checking with personnel were extremely valid and there would be uh, no retraction. Uh, nothing could be done until this strike was settled on Tuesday, possibly next week. You're not a member of the union? No, I am not. I am what you call a uh, temporary term. You were on probation, is that right? You just yes, been working? Yes, with a contract renewed uh, for a further three months, which says to me my work must have been satisfactory. What, what's your feeling about this? Are you a pawn between two Goliaths? I most certainly feel this way. Um, you're trying, well, you're asked to serve two masters. Uh, neither one uh, can be pleased. I understand in order to uh, become a permanent employee or six months thereafter, you become eligible for membership in the union. If you cross their picket lines, uh, you are blacklisted, you will never receive membership. However, if you don't go to work, now uh, I've lost the competition obviously, uh, I am now fired. So uh, no matter what you do, you are incorrect. You, you just have nowhere to turn. There's nobody that you can phone. You phone the union. Uh, they say our hands are tied at present. Uh, management, I'm sorry, I feel, has been very ununderstanding in this situation. They've asked the impossible. Jack, we came down to the taxation center in Surrey to talk about Elizabeth Brown's case. And Mel Sapp, the personnel manager here, has agreed to talk to us about it. Mel, what about Elizabeth's case? Elizabeth was a casual employee hired to do a specific job. Generally speaking, employees whom we hire such as that are allowed um, very few absences because they are here to do a specific function. If they are absent, they get a warning from us. Now, in Elizabeth's case, we weren't aware that she was absent for any reason for just cause. For example, a casual employee during the period of the strike was not allowed to be on strike, was not in a lawful position to strike. So they had to report for duty. She was uh, told, though, by her supervisor that she should just go home and listen to the news and see what happens, which she did. Okay, that's very possible. As you can well imagine, it was a very confusing period for everyone. Um, if she has received such an instructions and acted uh, in accordance with the instructions, then certainly all she has to do is come in and talk to us about it and we'll certainly rescind if we've made an error. How many other people are involved in this? That was obviously a form letter. Are there any others? I believe there were about 12. And they can do the same thing? They can come down here and say, look, uh, it was confusing. I didn't know what to do and can I have my job back? Certainly. Certainly we're willing to talk to anybody who had a legitimate reason for not being here. You don't think that maybe the Surrey Taxation Office acted a bit prematurely under the circumstances? No, we're following guidelines provided us by Treasury Board. The guidelines were quite clear. If you didn't report for work as a casual or a non-union member, you received a notice of dismissal. Elizabeth's case, of course, is that she didn't get the notice at the right time and that a supervisor had said, oh, you better stay home and listen to the radio. So hopefully, at least in her case, but I would hope in all the cases of casuals, that they're treated with a little bit of generosity, or that's merely another irritation among these apparently unhappy clerks. Now, I've got time for the moment, while we're juggling things, to present to you three pieces of my mail this week. And I do like to get mail that I can read, if you remember. It will give you the letter, the post office box later. The first one comes from Langley, and it's a good letter. Dear Webster, I like scanners. Remember I was screaming about them? I don't have any problems checking the shelf prices and I certainly find it easy to check the price list when I get home. Yours truly, Mrs. E. Downey Langley, 
Yes, my problem is bifocal glasses. Second letter. I don't know why this, oh yes. Today, you discussed with Mr. Perry the case of a waitress moved from Newfoundland to BC at government expense. With tongue in cheek, I would like to ask, that's Murray Perry, if it is possible to bring a person from Newfoundland to dig my garden naturally with government keep. It seems impossible to get that type of worker here. If one phones manpower or whatever, we are told that casual labor is difficult to find in Burnaby because the casual pool is in Vancouver and people don't want to or can't travel to this distant Burnaby sincerely in Burnaby. Just stop there for a minute while I talk about it. No, I won't. I'll do the next letter, then I'll talk. Webster, in your typical black is black and white is white charges against Southern Press, you seem to ignore the main reasons that these newspapers are failing. In my layman's opinion, you have missed the most important factor. These failed and failing papers are poorly run and the presentation of news is atrocious. Papers like the Toronto Globe and Mail are worth 50 cents because they give one a balanced look at national and international news, reviews, business, theater, arts, and good articles by people who can really communicate. The trouble with the columnists in the Sun and the province is that they can't write. And this applies to Winnipeg Trib and Ottawa Journal. Oh, for a James Minifee, Beverly Baxter, Richard Needham, William Hickey. Oh, for some good, honest journalism. Mr. Tuck, I think, from a hundred mile house. Back to the waitress just for a moment. You can take away the letter slug. That was a story that I don't want to forget. That was the guy in Cash Creek who needed a waitress. We couldn't supply one from Ashcroft or Kamloops. So they put his request for a waitress at 4.50 an hour on the computer. Then they gave a girl in Newfoundland $1,880.60 to relocate in, from Newfoundland as a waitress in Cash Creek, and she kept the job for five weeks, and God knows where she is now. I'll be back after the break. <laughs> The experiences of the two youngsters in my studio now are almost beyond belief. On my right is Donna Johnson. On my left is Brent Dyer. The book is called The Sacrament. It was written by my old friend, who's a very sensitive guy, called Peter Gzowski. Peter Zosky. And the book is called The Sacrament for a Reason. But we'll come to that later. When was it the plane crashed? Who was in the plane? When was it the plane crashed? Where did it crash? The plane crashed May 5th of 79. Donna and myself, Donna's father, Don, and the pilot, Norm Pishke, were on the plane, and we crashed in the White Cloud Mountains of Idaho. You were flying from where to where? From Estevan, Saskatchewan, to Boise, Idaho. And at that time, how old were you? I was 17. 17 years of age. Yeah. Now, the, the crash itself was a horrifying experience. Yeah, I don't remember actually crashing, but waking up afterwards, yes. It was a small plane? Yeah, it was a Cessna 172. And there were four of you in it. Mm -hmm. Your father and the other person was the pilot. Right. Yeah. Now, perhaps we can get, when you recovered consciousness on the ground, can you tell me what you found? Well, I was awakened by Donna screaming that Dad's dead, Dad's dead. And I was in the front, so I turned around and, and looked into the back, and he had been killed. And the first thing I noticed that Donna was wearing his coat, and I said, he's dead, Donna, but he's given you his coat. He wanted you to live. Now, you at that time, what did you remember of crashing and awakening? Well, the first thing that I can remember when I woke up was looking over, noticing that Dad was dead, and then looking up at Brant and noticing like the side of his neck was cut and just the blood running out and just wondering what had happened or where were we. And then for almost a day and a half, two days, we just kind of kept fading in and out of consciousness. Mm -hmm. How high were you on the hillside? The altimeter registered 9,750 feet. Look, you, you youngsters survived in incredible circumstances, but how long was it before you were able to move about? Didn't you have a bit, oh, what happened to the pilot first? 
Well, when we hit, he was throwing ahead, and his head struck the throttle, and he had a, a big gash on the side of his head, and he couldn't talk at all. But he made us understand that he was going somewhere, and he was walking back down the canyon. We flew in, and neither of us remember going in, so we'd always hoped that he'd seen something and was going back out, but there wasn't anything. How long after the crash before he walked away, do you think? I think it was the next day, like probably Sunday in the afternoon sometime. Meantime, the two of you are still fading in and out of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Cold? Freezing cold. <laughs> You'll never forget that, will you? No, it, it was just the, it just hurt the cold. It just hurt? Yeah. Did you have many injuries of your own? Um, my right palm had a severe cut in it. I had a broken finger and a cracked wrist, and throughout the whole ordeal, my feet became severely frostbitten. And you? My left arm was broken, and I received a lot of cuts on my face. My jaw was crushed, my lower teeth were knocked out and left hanging in the gums. I had some cuts on the back of my head, this type of thing. Yeah, you pulled your teeth out with your fingers. Yeah, they were hanging down and I kept gagging on them, so. Now what did you do for food and sustenance and heat? Well... Forget the food for the moment. Tell me, what did you do for heat and what? Oh, and you had some food. Some smarties and granola bar and sunflower seeds and cough drops and we ate the toothpaste and we found a couple of pop. A cup of pop. A, a bottle of pop. A bottle of yeah. pop. Yeah. One of the things that impressed me most was the fire. Tell me about making a fire. Well, you had perched on the side of a mountain. In fact, there's a picture in the book of the plane. Was that the plane when it was found? That's the the plane. It, yeah, on the back cover, it was. Yeah. When the FAA and the rescue team flew in after we walked out, that was the plane there. Okay. Now, how did you heat yourself in the meantime? Well, I had, at first, when the storm was still on, it, the storm stayed for a couple of days and the right-hand door was knocked open during the impact and I was able to take a coat hanger underneath the wing and poke the little valve where you test to see if, it, if there's any water in your tanks and catch it in a pop bottle. Any gas in your tanks? There was lots of gas in the tanks and we, all we could do was pour it on the floor of the cabin and my lighter was empty but just a spark of it, uh, we were able to ignite the fire. All we had was a, a few like maps and some air sickness bags that, to keep it going. So finally, we just had to keep pouring raw gas on the floor, and it lasted well about a, a day, just until the storm kind of subsided, and then we couldn't get any more gas. Now, um, now when you left the plane, how many days was it after you had hit the ground before you got up? We stayed at the plane for 14 days, and we started to walk, and we walked for five days. Five days. Mm -hmm. That was a nightmare too, wasn't it? Yeah, it would, at least one thing walking at night. We couldn't walk before that, so we couldn't get out for any firewood. And at least by walking, we could get to a fallen tree and, and we were warm at night. In other words, once you got the fallen tree, you had enough gas to burn. We had, just before we'd left, Donna got up on the wing and the snow had melted out and was able to shake the plane enough that we could get three more pop bottles full of gas. And your father's body still in the back? When yeah. we left, yeah. When you left. Now, how do I ask the next question? Could you talk about it in the book? The sacrament. Why have you called it the sacrament? Well, the, the whole experience was, it, it changed me around completely as far as my belief in God. I had never believed much before. And I, I, I'd always needed that proof, but I have it now, and I have a very strong belief in, and a very comfortable belief in God. And that's what the title means to me. Donna? I feel the same as Brant, that the whole experience was so close to us and deep inside of us, like, and religious aspect of it. So what you felt was that the food that you consumed was, in effect, a kind of holy communion. Yeah, and we'd always felt that the decision had been made in the beginning when Donna's father gave her his coat, but really he'd given Donna his life. and. The last thing he could possibly do was to give his life for his daughter to try to maintain her life. And it was that particular aspect of supplying itself with some protein that saved your life. Mm -hmm. Have you been embarrassed by interviews in this across the country, or is your faith so strong that you couldn't be? I wouldn't try no. to embarrass you anyway, and I'm sure people know what I'm saying. No, they've been good. They people have been able to understand that. Like what they seem find hard to understand is how we were able to live, like, 19 days in a snowbank. And you tell me that. When you came out, where did you come out to? Livingston, Livingston Mine. 
in Idaho. And you walked in, I remember what the farmer or somebody said to you, tell me. Well, at first he didn't... What did you look like? A couple of scarecrows. Oh, we, well, our clothes <laughs> were been burnt and we were just black. And I said to him, can you help us? We've been in an airplane crash. And he said, oh. And I couldn't believe it that, you know, he thought we were a couple of hippies, but nobody comes out of the mountains looking like that. I mean, and finally I said to him, I'm Brent Dyer of Mestman, Saskatchewan, Canada. He said, oh, you're those Canadians. They don't have any electricity or telephones there, but they had a little small radio and they heard a little bit on the radio about an airplane from Canada that had gone down. So, how did they treat you? Well, they're kind of like backwards in the hills, so when they, somebody else new came to visit, you know, it was kind of something special to them. So when they had us there, it seemed like they didn't want to let us go back out into civilization, but like they treated us really good. They gave us food to eat and blankets to keep warm. And it, she kept delaying and delaying to go down the phone to get somebody to drive us up. But, Finally that night she had to drive seven miles to the nearest phone to phone the sheriff and they came up and picked us up. And even when we did go, she asked that once we went and phoned our families if we would come back and spend the night with her. They did know. Uh, we had no, no the sheriff took us right to the doctor's office. Yeah. yeah, when you got to the doctor's office, was your jaw broken? It was crushed and in the meantime it had all got infected and I had a big ball of pus there and he lanced it. But you kept it a secret. You kept your personal sacrament secret, did you not, for a long time? Well, I, go ahead. Go on. It was until, like, we got with our families and until we had the funeral for Dad. And after the funeral for Dad. Mm -hmm. They went back and got his body. Yeah. Yes. More with Brent. Get the names right, Webster. Brent Dyer and Donna Johnson on the tremendous experience which seems to have not done them too much harm in the long run maybe some good after the break i'm not going any deeper into the situation which was faced by these two young people how old are you brent i'm 26 now. 26 and you are now 19. donna johnson who found themselves in the back of a plane somewhere in the white cloud mountains with Donna's father dead in the back and the pilot staggers away injured to try and get help and what eventually happened to him? He made it after the search and rescue team went to the plane after we walked out they found him about a mile down the canyon. Dead? And he'd collapsed yeah, in the snow. Um, was this plane properly equipped to be found at the time? Did you have an emergency transmitter on board? No there wasn't any ELT on the aircraft. Was it a flight plan filed, or did the pilot change his course on the way because of the bad weather? Well, they had figured that he would take the more regular course around the highest mountains, and during the search they didn't figure it was possible for us to get as deep into the mountains as we had with the load of gas and, and passengers. Mm -hmm. So for the 15 days, wasn't there somebody up in Saskatchewan, you're from Estevan, aren't you? Yeah. Right who was quite sure you were still alive and was trying to organize additional searches after the official search was called off? Our family said that no matter how long it took that they would never give up the search, just even to know, like even if they were all dead, just to know what had happened. And there was two young kids from the school that that day they had had a, a, a radio tele telethon, telethon and there was two dances that evening when we walked out to raise more money to continue the search on. And when we walked out, the, the first dance, the younger kids' dance, was over. And it was the, the older people's dance that they had announced that we had walked out. At the dance when they had money on, but you two were still alive, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, uh, when you got into this little town in the States, what was it called? Chalice. Chalice. Where is that? About the middle of Idaho. Mm -hmm. Chalice and Idaho. Were people surprised at the, your physical condition, or was it so bad anyway that what you had done only helped to keep you barely alive? Well, they, there they, they had always felt that when we went to the doctor's office that we'd made it 19 days up till then, and the, they felt the best thing that for us would be to get to the hotel and be reunited with our families rather than going into a hospital. And, Don and I were afraid that when we got back home that we'd be stuck in a hospital, but even back there they allowed us to go home and we went back to the, the hospital every day to be checked over. How difficult the decision was it to have the communion of flesh? 
Did it come naturally or did you sweat over it? Or did you? Well, we prayed a lot. Prayed a lot about, about, it. about it a lot. And we knew that, well, like Dad had given up his coat in order that I could live. And I knew that he wanted me to get back home and just to die on him, like nine days later on the side of the mountain. It just wasn't right. Mm -hmm. Quite an incredible experience. Doesn't seem to have marked either of you. Too bad you ever dream? Did you ever have nightmares about the crash? No, no. never had any nightmares, no. no. Oh, that's good. You've been on every show in the country. Zosky wrote the book. How long did it, was, was it good to work with Zosky? Yeah, it was really good. Easy to work with him, and, and we're very pleased with how he has been able to put what we felt and tried to put into words how he was able to put yeah, it into words. Yeah, it's a words. sensitive, sympathetic book. Now, the first time it's been done in recent years, my Jim, I'm talking about the particular method of survival. I don't suppose it'll ever become commonplace. Only in those circumstances where you have the, the kind of religious drive to feel that everything is copacetic. Hmm? My grateful thanks to Brent Dyer and Donna Johnson and their incredible story of the sacrament. Thanks Thank very you. much for coming. Thank I'll you. be back after the break. This is Friday morning, isn't it? Yes. And this is supposed to be a happy morning. Well, I was quite impressed with the youngsters, but it wasn't exactly the happiest of stories in the world, although if they got some religious faith and feeling out of it, it's no loss, I'll tell you that. So Bob Kaplan's Lister General was to be here this morning, and he hasn't shown. So I think we'll have this morning a free-for-all, if we can keep it pretty bright, on some of the stuff we've perhaps done this week. I hope I got the message about brick across clearly. I'm having some arguments with some of my colleagues on what was done. I say that this new agreement that's been made by brick on the Kaiser takeover is a distinct retreat by the brick directors and by David Hellowell. When they're responding to public pressure as well as stock market pressure, I'm sure, in giving themselves a 90-day option to get rid of the sales marketing deal taken over by Kaiser. And there was one very interesting Kaiser aspect too which hasn't been pointed out. But I happen to know that after the deal was done, it was learned as of the 7th of October, the Kaiser, before the takeover, was going to keep two of the three jet aircraft and Brick would take over the third aircraft, so our brick is going to have its own jet aircraft. But the point I want to mention to you is that seven of, of uh, bricks, no, seven of Kaiser's aircraft maintenance people are already being laid off. Now, I believe I've got Bob Kaplan, the Solicitor General, here this morning, fresh in from the airport on another jet. This, however, a jet owned by the taxpayers of Canada. But while well, he's Yuck, you don't need to make him up. Bring him over without makeup. Doesn't matter. Come on in, Bob. Okay. Can I call a cabinet minister, Bob? Yes, sir. Well, you know how many times I went on your hotline. Do so. I want to call a liberal by his first name, Bob? And you haven't got a microphone you can't answer yet. And I have some notes for you here. Jack, but, I was sure you'd be staying in Gastown. I used to like coming to your hotline show when you were there. You've not been on the television show no, with me before. this is the first time. Your you know. constituency is Downsview. York Centre in Downsview in York Toronto. York Centre in Downsview in Toronto. That's right. And you were a backbencher the last time. No, you are a parliamentary secretary. The last time, that's right. To whom? At that time, to finance. Parliamentary secretary of finance. Yeah. Now you're a full-fledged solicitor general. Yes, and then I came as a member of the opposition. You remember immigration critic in the opposition. Were you liberals ever in the opposition? <laughs> yes, we sure were. And now you're responsible for the RCMP yeah. and the jails. That's right. That's correct. Yes, sir. Oh, dear. <laughs> and a hostage is currently taking place. A hostage deal is still underway That's at right. Dorchester, where the three convicted murderers are holding two guards hostage in a barricaded cell block. That's right. And, What's uh, the score on that this morning? Have you well, been filled in? Well, in fact, it's worse than that because there are two hostages, but there are also 17 inmates, rather docile inmates, who are in the background there, and the uh, hostage takers have threatened to start cutting them up. But I have reason now to be optimistic that that incident will come to an end in the next few hours, I hope, and come to an end without any serious injury. So some kind of talks are still taking place? Yes. 
Oh yeah, we're in constant communication with the hostage takers and I'm kept informed about it. In fact, as soon as I landed, I phoned back to Ottawa just to find out how it was going. These are tricky things. Is there any answer to them at all? Well, you know, every uh, single hostage taking is avoidable. That's the problem. And uh, I've had an inquiry conducted after everyone, and we've learned something from them. And th the most interesting thing to me as a kind of new man on the job is that it isn't negligence that is usually the factor. What usually is happening is that you're dealing with individuals who are dedicated to escaping, and these hostages were taken in the course of an escape. And keeping ahead of them requires uh, constant uh, rethinking of our security system and constant improvements in the system that we have. So we learn from everyone. Uh, we don't have a great increase. You know, you might have thought that there's been an increase in the last few years. In fact, there's been a decrease. But even one, you know, when a, particularly when a member of our union, the correctional officer or an innocent uh, free person, is the hostage. It's serious. You have a policy of no deals, though, don't you? Yes, that's right. And in this case, we've adhered rigidly to it. Because they wanted to leave the country or something. Yeah. Well, you know, a few years ago, the main deal that they wanted was access to the media. The big thing that the inmates wanted was to get their day before public opinion. And so we just removed that restriction. And now inmates are, you know, they don't have to take hostages to state their case. They write letters to the editor. They occasionally can appear on television programs and so on. And that one decision in itself has reduced a lot of hostages. Can I have your permission right now to get that fellow on who came from the United States? I expected to serve five years, and it turns out that the sentence transfers into 45 this is years. This Mr. In Clifford. Clifford, in yeah. the Canadian prison. Yeah, I talked to him when I went up to Kent, and I'm not satisfied that he was misinformed or uninformed about the system. He was actually given the booklet, and the booklet does contain a statement, and he ought to have known that uh, he had to stay here for seven years before he'd be eligible for parole. But you know what I found lately is that in Texas, although he would have been eligible in five years, it's not that easy to get parole in Texas. They're much tougher on parole than it's they are here. It's much easier in this country to get parole, isn't it? Well, uh, it is somewhat easier to get it in this country. But in Texas, public opinion is moving uh, very rapidly against, and paroles are becoming tougher. And I think it's taking a lot for granted to assume that Clifford would actually have been paroled after five years. Are you in telling the States. me, Clifford, if he's watching, that he's eligible for parole after seven years? He's eligible to apply for parole, but that doesn't mean he's going to get it. He's got, he has committed a serious offense. He has two convictions in his past, and those will all be taken into consideration. And of course, whether he's a good inmate between now and then. So the fact that he has the longest single minimum term of any prisoner in a Canadian prison of 45 years is really uh, not quite substantive in its own way. It's not a bar to getting pro to making a parole application after uh, after those few years. Can I have him on air? Uh, well, let me look into it. I, I like the idea, but he might require an escort to come here, and I want to see if we can handle the overtime and arrange to do it. But in principle, uh, he's as you can see, he's been free to talk to the press. He's certainly quite funny. We went out to talk to some of the people at Kent. One of my reporters went out to talk to some of the people about Kent mm -hmm. about this apparent refusal to accept the conjugal extensions. Yeah. And they didn't want to talk to us. Forget why. Can anybody remember why they didn't want to talk to us at the time? Steve, where are you? I'll find out later. Well, you know, that program is getting mixed reviews, both from the union of Solicitor General employees who are worried about contraband and worried about discipline on the one side, and from inmates on the other side because uh, not all inmates will be eligible for it. But you know, I've sent some of our officials down to the states. I've been myself to four family visiting facilities in California. We visited Attica. Some of our people went down. And even though in some of those, less than 25% of the inmates are eligible for it because they don't have that relationship, it still works very well. It helps reduce tensions. It helps maintain order. And I just don't understand why it shouldn't work. You're in our planning an ex conjugal visits in all major prisons? Well, we are starting, and our ultimate goal will be to have them in all. At the moment, we're committed to have uh, six by, you know. Including, in, um, is it Kent? Kent, I believe, yeah. Wives? Wives. Husbands? Uh, husbands. Children? Children. Mother, father, sister, Mother, brother. father, sister, brother. 
Common law? And common law if the couple can demonstrate a six-month relationship before being incarcerated. Yeah, not girlfriends. Well, that would be the girlfriend, but someone who you've met while you're in prison, no, or a stranger or a casual... Homosexuals? Friends, no. No? No. But uh, any kind of sincere common law relationship, husband, wives, and children, and, and yeah, relatives. I don't deny that there are some valid relationships beyond where I've drawn the line, but I think if we try and extend it, we'll have a lot of difficulty with the program. You have a lot of public resentment, too. Well, you know, at the end, how do you really sift out the quality of the relationship that a person has with someone they've met while they're in prison or with someone that they don't know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I just feel that a viable program should be limited in that way, and that is the way it's going to be. We're going to talk more with Solicitor General Bob Kaplan after the break. <laughs>